Nothing more hide. Any change that you have, yeah, we're taking any change. Every little bit is going to make a big difference. Any change, please, brothers. Just nothing more hide. Any change to charity, sir? Feeding the needy. Just nothing more hide. Whatever change you've got, inshallah. Just nothing more hide. Sam, Uncle Bro, listen, you need to be a little bit more assertive, yeah? Well, like some, really, but, but. Yeah, just try and speak louder and talk to people. Uh, okay, inshallah. Slanka, brother, uh, MRDF. What's MRDF, brother? We build leaders, brother. I don't want to waste my sadaqa. I, I want to give it to the needy. The Sahaba considered money being spent in the path of Allah as one of the highest forms of sadaqa. The people who are developed as Muslim leaders through our projects affect the lives of hundreds and thousands of Muslims. Every single good deed they guide someone to, you will get a copy of that deed. Allah will give you a share without taking anything away from them. You never know what impact they will go on to have. Just one brother that we know of started an Islamic channel that is on mainstream TV, benefiting thousands around the world. The choice is yours. This Ramadan, will you give a continuous charity that will carry on even after you are gone? Don't miss out. Click the button and start earning this reward now. And don't forget to share this video. It's free and makes a serious difference to our work. Islam 21C brings to you 20 brand new unique series from renowned and respected Shuyuk from across the globe with one mission to bring Muslims together in an online congregation never seen before in history and lift the spirit of this Ramadan to bring us closer to Allah more than ever. The man is left with no way of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala other than by virtue of his, of his names and his majestic attributes that he gave himself and gifted humanity with. We want to raise our children in the most perfect way and perfection belongs to Allah. If a person comes to you whose religion and character pleases you, then get your daughters married to him. It's not going to be easy, but Allah never leaves you alone. That's the essence of what we can get from the Prophet's life. It's my pleasure, it's my honor to introduce Quran recitation from uh, the Imam Jazri Institute. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim Bismillah Now just think with me about the verse where Allah says Inna Allah yumsiku al-samawati wal-arda an tazula We'll start off with an ease one for you, Shaykh, inshallah. Can I postpone taraweeh until the last third of the night? Yeah, so um, essentially the, the night prayer is offered after Salat al-Isha and you have until Salat al-Fajr to, to offer that. We're all, we're all linked together in this. And that's really what empathy is. I mean, empathy in, in the Arabic is like atuf, 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 to, to tilt towards, to move towards. Conveying insults. You know, the Arabs had a saying, ma shatamak illa man ballagak. The one who insulted you is the one who conveyed the insult to you. There can be no more greater relationship of a husband and a wife than the Prophet and Khadija. We don't just leave that piece of knowledge that we've received 
just there on the page. This virus is a mercy for us Muslims because the Prophet ﷺ, he tells us in a hadith that when you are afflicted with something, it's an expiation of your sins. Down to earth like gravity, imagine me trying to turn my dreams to reality. Allah Jalla mentioned those who come in the front. They are the most successful people. How we can embed the love of the Quran in the hearts of the young generation? Welcome to the online masjid. Sign up now for your personal access to 300 plus free on demand video content. Ramadan has always been about the Quran, spirituality, and community. We fast together, break our fast together, pray together, and celebrate together. And it always comes at the right time and feeds your mind, body, and soul. But how can we do all of that in quarantine? For the most unique Ramadan we've ever experienced, the most unique experience we've ever launched. Ramadan 360, a global community experiencing Ramadan together to feed your mind, body, and soul. Wouldn't it be amazing to be in a position to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and say, Ya Allah, I wasn't a person who merely complained about the status quo of the ummah and wind. I was a person who supported the scholars of the religion. I made projects and I supported them as well. I was a person, Ya Rabb, who not only wanted to change what is within myself, but I also then after doing that, I wanted to change others and benefit them. Is it not a dream come true to be able to say such words? Make it a reality, dear brothers and sisters. Thousands of Muslims all across the world have benefited from our projects, alhamdulillah. And we want to be able to continue to do so and we want you to share in the reward. Your money creates Muslims who benefit other Muslims, who go on to benefit other Muslims, creating a domino effect for your donation. And at this moment in time, we require 1,000 people to donate 100 pound each to help us reach our goal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you a means of guidance. The Islamic Council of Europe is here to help you, to help you in your marriage, to help you in terms of relationship between both of you, to help you in your relationship with your children, to solve some unsolvable problems. The Islamic Council of Europe, providing support, guidance, and solutions. Bismillah, salatu wa salam, rasulillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear brothers and sisters. I hope you're all well. Firstly, I want to welcome you to this amazing event that's going to be taking place. I know we're still in this these unprecedented times. Uh, we're here in the UK at least, we're in lockdown, uh, but subhanAllah, we're not going to let that take away from what is important and the most important thing that we need to strive towards, and that is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters, we brought to you this family iftar event, which normally takes place in person, but we're bringing it to you online, so you can enjoy with us, inshallah, an iftar of your home cooked meals, inshallah. My dear brothers and sisters, we're joined by five speakers hailing from across the globe, We'll be covering some amazing topics tonight, inshallah. The first of those, we have Sheikh Sajid Omar. Uh, I should say, sorry, Sheikh Dr. Sajid Omar. We congratulate him on completing his PhD and being awarded his PhD, who comes and hails all the way from the blessed land of where the Haram is, uh, and that is none other than Saudi Arabia. And then, alhamdulillah, all the way from the US, we have Sheikh Kamal and Sheikh Ahmed. Uh, may Allah bless them both. And then we have from the exotic land of Wales, our dear Sheikh, Sheikh Ali Hamouda. And from the best city of the world, we have our dear Sheikh, Sheikh Asim Khan. So my dear brothers and sisters, the topics that we'll be covering this evening, be idnillah, will not only be relevant, but they'll be high impacting. And most importantly, they'll be practical. So we can have something to take away to make the most of these last nights and days of Ramadan, be idnillah. Of the topics that we'll be discussing is how to make the how to make the most of this month and how to end it better than we started it. How to make the most of du'a, and what is the night that is better than a thousand months, the night of Laylatul Qadr? How to make uh, Eid fun for you and your family this year? And lastly, living the new you post Ramadan and maybe post 
uh, COVID-19, inshallah. With that regard, my dear brothers and sisters, we have some exciting prize giveaways this year, alhamdulillah. For, for you to have a chance to win this prize, all the prizes, I need you to go to familyeat.com, sign up, uh, and you'll have the opportunity to win an Amazon Fire tablet and a number of Amazon vouchers that we have as a part of this prize giveaway, alhamdulillah. So if you want to, again, if you want to be a part of it, go to familyeat.com, get your family, get your friends, get as many people you know who are over 60 and have an email address to sign up. And what I've been told is the more people an individual can sign up, potentially the greater chance they have of winning. And on the 25th uh, of May, inshallah, which will, is likely to be the day of Eid, we'll be announcing on that special day who those winners are, inshallah. So my dear brothers and sisters, the topics that we'll be covering this evening, be idnillah, will not only be relevant, but they'll be high impacting. And most importantly, they'll be practical. So we can have something to take away to make the most of these last nights and days of Ramadan, be idnillah. Of the topics that we'll be discussing is how to make the how to make the most of this month and how to end it better than we started it. How to make the most of dua. And what is the night that is better than a thousand months, the night of Laylatul Qadr? How to make uh, Eid fun for you and your family this year? And lastly, living the new you post Ramadan and maybe post uh, COVID-19, inshallah. With that regard, my dear brothers and sisters, we have some exciting prize giveaways this year, alhamdulillah. For, for you to have a chance to win this prize, all the prizes, I need you to go to familyeat.com, sign up, uh, and you'll have the opportunity to win an Amazon Fire tablet and a number of Amazon vouchers that we have as a part of this prize giveaway, alhamdulillah. So if you want to, again, if you want to be a part of it, go to familyeat.com, get your family, get your friends, get as many people you know who are over 60 and have an email address to sign up. And what I've been told is the more people an individual can sign up, potentially the greater chance they have of winning. And on the 25th uh, of May, inshallah, which will, is likely to be the day of Eid, we'll be announcing on that special day who those winners are, inshallah. So without further ado, my dear brothers and sisters, firstly, I would like to invite our dear Sheikh, Sheikh Ali Hamouda, to our virtual stage to deliver his words about having a strong finish this Ramadan. Uh, our dear Sheikh, Sheikh Ali, he holds a BA in Sharia from the prestigious University of Al-Azhar, and he is an author of several books, articles, and appears across a number of platforms, including TV and social media across the globe. So without further ado, Sheikh Ali. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Dear brothers and sisters, I want to share with you four oaths that were taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran to draw our attention to something. What duha, he said, I swear by the morning brightness. What layli, he said, I swear by the night. What fajri, I swear by dawn. And he said, what asr, I swear by time. Four oaths from different passages in the Quran, from the many oaths that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken. Now, we know that Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, being the greatest, will only ever take an oath upon those matters that are most great. And the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses time to be one of those subjects of his oath, that in itself, subhanAllah, speaks volumes in of itself. See, it's around this time, roughly in the month of Ramadan, where we begin to hear people saying, Ya Allah, Ramadan is flying by so quick, it's, it's bidding us fa farewell already. Where has the time gone? Not only is this a valid observation, but it is one that is only increasing in validity each year as we feel that the barakah, the blessing of time is just being stripped away from us each year. And that is one of the signs of the end of time. As the Prophet Muhammad said, Al Hasan al Basri, he said, Yabna Adam, son of man, Inna anta ayyam, fa ida dahaba yawmun dahaba ba'aduk, O son of Adam, you are made up of days. So when a day passes by, part of you has left you, part of you has died, hours, minutes, seconds. That's what you and I are. So each day of Ramadan, that ends, that demarcates the ending of a part of you. And now that we are nearing the finish line of the month of Ramadan, I'm sure you are wondering, much like myself, 
What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala think of me? How well have I been doing? Have I succeeded in the eyes of Allah? What is my status in His eyes? I want to offer you a benchmark to measure and to estimate the answer. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man arada an ya'lama ma lahu indallahi fal yanzur ma lillahi indahu Whoever wants to know where he stands with Allah, then he needs to consider where Allah stands with him. Allahu Akbar. See, you get an idea of what your employer thinks of you, depending on the nature of the task that he assigns you with. Should he offer you a major task and he entrusts you with noble affairs, you know that your employer thinks high of you. And similarly, if he was to give you petty matters, it gives you an accurate reflection of where you stand in his or her eyes. This is so true with respect to your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Simply look at what he has assigned you with so far this Ramadan. And then you make your own decision regarding where you stand, what your status is in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, for example, if you have been occupied with Quran and maybe na'wah or prayer or real repentance and vision setting and change, this is an amazing sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thinks high of you. If, however, you have been assigned to sluggishness and half-heartedness and excessive sleep and uh, neglect of dua and excessive TV, neglect of Quran, insisting upon sins, nothing is changing. This is a worrying sign that screams for your attention as per where you may be in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have been assigned with these tasks. I ask a question here. Are you like me who wishes that they could have done a lot better this Ramadan. Perhaps maybe you are still struggling with certain habits. Maybe you feel that your heart is still rock solid, not softening for the remembrance of Allah. Maybe sluggishness and laziness has not changed much. Maybe your eyes remain by and large tearless, unable to shed a tear from the hope or fear or love of Allah. But there is something worse. There is. And that is to doubt the enormous opportunity that's now ahead of you. To not only potentially catch up with the others who have overcome you in the month of Ramadan, but to also beat them in the race and to be written with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as amongst the eternally happy ones. This is possible with what remains as Imam ibn al-Jawzi he would say. Inna al-khayla. إذا شارفت نهاية المضمار بذلت قصارى جهدها لتفوز بالسباق. He said, whenever horses race and they come closer to the finish line, they exert their maximum effort to win the race. He said, فلا تكن الخيل أفضل منك. Therefore, beware of allowing horses to be any wiser than you. Allah Akbar. He said, فإنما الأعمال بالخواتيم. Because actions are truly by their endings. Actions are truly by their endings. What hopeful words. And then he concludes Ibn al-Jawzi by saying, فَإِنَّكَ إِذَا لَمْ تُحْسِنِ الْإِسْتِقْبَالِ لَعَلَّكَ تُحْسِنِ الْوَدَعْبِ And therefore, if you didn't do too well in the reception of Ramadan, maybe you do well in the farewell of Ramadan. You didn't do well in the reception of Ramadan. Maybe you will do well in the bidding farewell to Ramadan. I mean, if the businessman is not planning to trade when marketplaces are open, how does he ever hope to make money? If the one who is ill with lifestyle-based illnesses is not changing his diet during his illness, when can he ever expect to recover and how? And similarly, if the Muslim who is witnessing the last 10 nights of the month of Ramadan is not now once and for all shaking normality off from himself, and freeing himself and herself from laziness, they're still not rousing from sleep and racing to Allah in desperation. When will they ever race? When will he ever reform his life? When will he ever change? When are you planning to do it if you are not going to do it now as the month of Ramadan farewells bids farewell and the gates of Jannah are about to close and the gates of the hellfire are about to open again? With that said, dear brothers and sisters, how relevant are the words of Angel Jibreel who said to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad, man adraka Ramadan falam yughfar lahu fa'ab'adahu Allah. Whoever witnesses the month of Ramadan, 
but still doesn't have all of his sins forgiven, then may Allah distance him. May Allah keep him away. He witnesses Ramadan, doesn't have his sins forgiven. May Allah keep him away, Jibreel, he said. And what is worrying, subhanAllah, is the response of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to this dua when he said, Ameen. He said, Ameen. That's right. A dua that was made by the greatest of the angels, Jibreel. And that was followed up by an Ameen, by the greatest of prophets, rather the greatest of creation, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A dua from them both against the one who rejects the opportunity of Ramadan and does not make the most of it. But rest assured, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never allow the sincere to walk away empty-handed from the month. If you're true to wanting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure in what remains of the month of Ramadan, then Allah Almighty will not leave your tree without leaves. Regardless of how slow you'd been at the start of the month of Ramadan, as Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he would say, Beautiful words. What matters the most are excellent endings, not faulty beginnings. What matters the most are excellent endings, not faulty beginnings. In fact, even in the example set by the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, himself, the effort that he would exert in the first 20 days of Ramadan was different to the effort that he would exert in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. It was different. According to his wife Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ يَجْتَهِدُ فِي رَمَضَانٍ مَا لَا يَجْتَهِدُ فِي غَيْرِهِ وَفِي الْعَشْرِ الْأَوَاخِرِ مِنْهُ مَا لَا يَجْتَهِدُ فِي غَيْرِهِ She said that. What did she say? She said that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, himself, his effort in worship in the month of Ramadan was greater than any other month. And his effort, however, during the last 10 nights of Ramadan was greater than any other effort before it. Ya Allah, subhanAllah, so why are you shooting yourself down? Why are you closing a door that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept open for you? Why is it that you concede to defeat when your Lord is still inviting you to succeed? And in this, I want to share with you three bits of advice that will be of practical benefit moving forward. Please take note of them, dear brothers and sisters. I believe that these will be game changers in what remains of your month of Ramadan, should you act upon them with ikhlas and with determination. Number one, clearly define your goals. Write them down and ensure that there is clarity in what you want to achieve by the rest of Ramadan, not just for what remains of Ramadan, by the way, but for the rest of your life. See, subhanAllah, when we aspire to get married, what happens? We do get married. And when we start job hunting, sooner or later, we find work. When we enroll onto a course at university, we finish it, we graduate. Why? The reasons why we get things done in terms of our dunya, our worldly pursuits, because of the clarity of the objective. You know exactly where you want to be, and how many years, and how you're going to get there, and the work ethic that is needed. So we get things done. But as for the, I'm going to do my best type of approach, it's not effective. It doesn't get you anywhere in life. So why allow your commitment to the relig religion to be anything lesser of a standard? Write down your Ramadan-based goals of what remains of this month. The prize is there. And write down your goals for the rest of your life. Do it with confidence. Start somewhere. Number two, create a pattern of alternation. What does that mean? It means vary your acts of worship. Move from the recitation of the Quran to then salah, prayer, to dua, passionate dua, and then dhikr, remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then tafakkur, deep contemplation, and their likes keep moving, keep moving. Because this type of alternation is a key way of dispelling boredom from our hearts. And there is no time to be bored now. That's number two. Number three, create a sense of urgency. Don't take this as a token of a reminder. Urgency. Diamonds only become diamonds when coal is subjected to pressure. Pressure makes diamonds. And so apply pressure upon yourself to compete for Jannah with the many competitors out there. Create a pressure on yourself to save yourself 
from Jahannam, from the hellfire. Create a pressure to be accepted by Allah and to be happy on the day of judgment. Really behave in these coming 10 nights as if you shall never witness their likes again. And any moment you feel a dip in enthusiasm, remember that a single hour in one of these particular nights that are coming up is greater than 3,000 days of actions. One hour greater than 3,000 days of actions. In other words, more than eight years. And that a single minute during one of these nights that are coming up is equivalent to 50 days worth of actions. A minute. It's more than 50 days. And as you've probably guessed it, these calculations are only there for the purpose of taqrib, to bring the meaning closer. The reality of Laylatul Qadr, the night of decree that we are searching for, it, it cannot be calculated. Because Allah did not say equivalent to a thousand months. He said khayrun, it is better than a thousand months. How much more? Uh, is it better than two thousand? Ten thousand months? Or a lifetime, as is in the speech of the Arabs, a thousand months? A lifetime? Allah Almighty knows best. It is more. In conclusion, brothers and sisters, time and time again, we are told that in these last 10 nights of Ramadan, this is when the Muslim needs to exert himself like never before. Because the prize is here, the prize of Jannah. And therefore, perhaps it is appropriate to remind ourselves of the nature of this prize. What does it actually mean to enter Jannah? What is Jannah? Ya Allah, Jannah, subhanAllah. Jannah is the promise that we had awaited for all of our lives. It is that home that our hearts had always yearned to return back to. That is Jannah. Jannah is the love which this world was too stingy to grant us. And the happiness which it was always unable to offer us. Jannah is the satisfaction which this world simply could never provide for us. That is Jannah, dear brothers and sisters. Jannah, subhanAllah, it is that reunion with those beautiful faces. Jannah is the reunion with those beautiful faces that we had missed and we had been deprived of. Jannah is meetings with the prophets and messengers. Jannah is conversations with the angels. Jannah is friendships with, with saints. Subhanallah, Jannah is farewell to sluggishness and illness and the beginning of uh, enduring fitness and vitality. Jannah is the end of restrictions and the beginning of freedom. Jannah is the end of rent, the end of tax, the end of debts, the beginning of true and permanent ownership. Jannah is the home of free reign. No sanctions, no barbed wire, no prisons, no fear of the unknown, no anxiety, no stress. That is Jannah. Jannah is the end of prohibitions, the end of borders, the end of limitations, the end of ever hearing the word no. Jannah is the end of boredom, the end of fatigue, the end of despair. Jannah is the end of death itself. Jannah is the end of the end. Allahu Akbar. Jannah is where we will never worry about being separated from our loved ones. Never again will we, will we be pulled apart from those whom we wanted to be next to. Never again will your heart break as it bids farewell to somebody who you wanted near to you. Jannah is where we will never be jealous again. And we will not want to sleep, nor will we need to sleep, nor will faces ever stop smiling. In Jannah, there is no bleeding. There are no tears. There are no obligations whatsoever. In Jannah, there is no gray hair. There is no late night revision. There is not a singular, there is not a single bachelor in Jannah. In Jannah, there is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Allah. In Jannah, we see the majestic face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is Jannah. Don't you miss it? If the answer is yes, then realize that this very home which was described 
is up for grabs in these last 10 nights of Ramadan. So honestly, minimize your appointments with people. Withdraw yourself from social media if need be and if possible for just a moment. Stop obsessing about your exercise for just a moment. Give your phone a rest. Put it on flight mode. Turn to dua, turn to salah, Quran, passionate repentance once and for all. Show Allah Jalla Jalaluhu that you are serious in wanting this home. Allah Almighty will not let you down. In reality, it is not Ramadan that is bidding us farewell. We are the ones who are bidding it farewell. When Ramadan goes, you see, it's going to be experienced by many people in the future. It's going to come back again and again. But when you and I depart from this world, we shall never be returned to it again. And that is why we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the best of our deeds, the last of them, and to make the best of our days, those days in which we finally meet you, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Ali, may Allah bless you and your family and keep them safe in these unprecedented times. What an amazing opening lecture you've given and the advice that you've given. I hope that we can all take that uh, and we can benefit from that and end this month much stronger than when we started it. Ameen, Ya Rab. My dear brothers, if you want to find out, and my dear sisters, if you want to find out more about our dear Sheikh or the lectures and find and listen more to him, you can do so by going to the online masjid. You can sign up there and you can find over 300 uh, episodes uh, and a number of series from various du'ad speakers and imams from across the world. So please do go and check it out and sign up. Islam 21C brings to you 20 brand new unique series from renowned and respected shuyuk from across the globe with one mission to bring Muslims together in an online congregation never seen before in history and lift the spirit of this Ramadan to bring us closer to Allah more than ever. The man is left with no way of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala other than by virtue of his, of his names and his majestic attributes that he gave himself and gifted humanity with. We want to raise our children in the most perfect way and perfection belongs to Allah. If a person comes to you whose religion and character pleases you, then get your daughters married to him. It's not going to be easy, but Allah never leaves you alone. That's the essence of what we can get from the Prophet's life. It's my pleasure, it's my honor to introduce Quran recitation from uh, the Imam Jazri Institute. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillah. Now just think with me about the verse where Allah says, Inna Allah yumsiku samawati wal arda an tazula. We'll start off with an easy one for you, Shaykh, inshallah. Can I postpone taraweeh until the last third of the night? Yeah, so um, <coughs> essentially the, the night prayer is offered after Salat al Isha and you have until Salat al Fajr to, to offer that. We're all, we're all linked together in this. And that's really what empathy is. I mean, empathy in, in Arabic is like ataf, ataf, atuf, to, to tilt towards, to move towards. Conveying insults. You know, the Arabs had a saying, ma shatamak illa man ballagak. The one who insulted you is the one who conveyed the insult to you. There can be no more greater relationship of a husband and a wife than the Prophet and Khadija. We don't just leave that piece of knowledge that we've received just there on the page. This virus is a mercy for us Muslims because the Prophet وسلم, he tells us in a hadith that when you are afflicted with something it's an expiation of your sins. Down to earth like gravity Imagine me trying to turn my dreams to reality Allah Jalla Ala mentioned those who come in the front They are the most successful people How we can embed the love of the Quran in the hearts of the young generation
Welcome to the online masjid. Sign up now for your personal access to 300 plus free on-demand video content. Welcome back, my dear brothers and sisters. Uh, and SubhanAllah, I'm now glad to invite our second speaker, our second Sheikh, Sheikh Ahmed, who hails all the way from the US. He's from the Al-Maghrib Institute and the Faith Essentials. So without any further delay, uh, I would like Sheikh Amir to uh, come to the virtual stage and discuss dua. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahibi sallam wa sallam kathira. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa hadahu la sharika lah. Ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Salatu rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi. To the uh, family, Ramadan family. Uh, I hope you guys are doing wonderful and you're enjoying your family iftars. And of course, I can't wait for my home cooked family iftar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. My name is Ammar al Shukri. I'm an instructor with the Maghrib Institute. Uh, uh, and um, I'm going to be talking about how you can get the most out of your dua in Ramadan. And I want to really just share a, a few points with you. Something very, very practical, very, very brief. I, um, you know, there's a hadith that I love very, very much, and I actually have it on my wall here. If you can see, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says, "Focus on what benefits you and seek the help of Allah, and don't give up." This hadith number one is really, really beautiful. It's reported by Muslim, and it gives us. A, a, a practical roadmap to, to success. You know, the self-help industry is billions of books, self-development, bil not billions of books, but billions of dollars worth of books and material. You go to any bookstore and you'll find all of these books about how to develop yourself and how to go this and how to live your dreams and how to and how to and how to. And here the Prophet ﷺ gives us three really practical steps that I want to kind of uh, manipulate for Ramadan. And number one is to focus on what benefits you. Focus on what benefits you, he says. And so the first thing you have to know is, is what are you asking for? What do you want? And that requires some thought. A lot of us, a lot of us use our dua as, as some completely robotic exercise. Disconnected from our life, the life that we are living, the things that we are complaining to our friends about every single day and calling mom about, uh, the things that we are venting on Facebook about or Instagram or whatever, the things that we are crying about day in and day out. When it comes to dua, none of that is communicated here. And that's the first thing that we have to remedy. إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ Ya'qub yeah, says, I complain my sadness and my grief only to Allah. And so, whereas we use all of these other channels for our complaints and for our sadness and for our grievances, and when it comes to dua, we're just saying some things that are robotic that were taught to us in grade school. Ya'qub is saying, no, this is the channel that I use. And so, number one is, is figuring out what it is that you want. Some of us uh, don't know what we want. I had a friend of mine who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given a lot of blessings to. And, you know, he was late 20s, already had a great job, already married. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with children. And so living in a beautiful state of California, right? Sunshine, beaches, all of that. So he, he I was in a car visiting him and he was saying to me, you know, I actually don't, I, I don't know what to make dua for. He's like, I've got, I've got it all. And that was kind of his moment of confession. And so I said to him, have you entered Jannah yet? And he said, oh, I guess I do have a lot of things to make dua for. Yeah. And this is a, a formula. If you don't, if you're not sure of what to, what to ask Allah for, this is a beautiful formula that we're given in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ It's a two to one ratio. 
atina fi dunya hasana that's for the dunya give us goodness in this world and give us goodness in the hereafter so it's one to one now ask for the dunya and ask for that hereafter wa qina adhab nar the hellfire protect us from the hellfire and so that is a 2 to 1 ratio of asking for dunya versus asking for akhirah 2 to 1 ratio of asking for akhirah as opposed to asking for dunya and of course you know the akhirah should occupy more of our duha that a person is asking Allah for jannah and hence the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when Aisha radiyallahu anha asked him she said if i'm experiencing laylatul qadr what should i ask for he said say اللهم انك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عني او الله you love to erase the trace of sin you love to completely overlook and pardon so have overlook my sins pardon me forgive and erase all of my sins right asking about the akhirah that moment of laylatul qadr that you ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the hereafter you ask him for forgiveness on the day of judgment so focus on what benefits you but even if it comes to the dunya focus on what benefits you figure it out what is it that you want what is it that you want to accomplish this year allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about laylatul qadr fiha yufraqu kullu amrin hakim on the night of power every matter of incredible uh, oh, every matter of, of 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 wisdom or greatness is determined on that day ibn abbas said even the names of the hujjaj for that day for that year for the hijja they're written on laylatul qadr so it is a day that you want to make sure that you are present but not just present you want to make sure that you are focused one of my teachers he mentioned that when he was a kid he he simply had uh, a goal of memorizing the quran he was in a hifz program and he he really wanted it he was making a lot of dua for it and he he on laylatul qadr every single night on the last 10 nights every single night he made sure to ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow him to to memorize the quran he was like i'm just going to i don't know which one is laylatul qadr i'm just going to go for that dua every single night for those 10 nights and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him that gift of memorizing the quran and so the point here is what is it that you want it doesn't have to be memorizing the quran and this is another point by the way a lot of us we spend a lot of very valuable real estate making dua for things that we don't really want we just think this is what a good muslim should ask for and so we're not very interested in memorizing for him memorizing the quran was a a real goal of his for for someone else it might not be a real goal it might not be something that they're interested in right now memorizing the complete quran and so you know what i'm not going to make dua for something just because I think this is what a good muslim should make dua for. Make dua for things that you are passionate about, that you care about, things that will make your eyes tear and your heart tremble and your tongue stutter, things that you really really care about. So that's number 1. Focus on what benefits you. And number 2, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, and then seek the help of Allah. Seek the help of Allah is incredibly powerful that you, you know, when you're embarking on whatever it is that you want that you constantly make dua to Allah that you recognize in your heart that if Allah wills it you will get it and if Allah does not will it it doesn't matter who says yes you're not going to get it and so when you enter into an audience with Allah in your dua that you recognize that you are entering the court of the king of kings that you enter recognize and, and and if you were going to enter into an audience with a king you would have prepared and so part of that is preparing you know what the 10 nights are coming prepare your dua list have your 6 or 7 or 8 or 10 or whatever most important things life changing the things that you care about the most that you want to accomplish within the next year make dua for those things have that list make sure that every single night you are making dua for those things chase those things so stand by Allah seek the help of Allah and then number 3 which is very powerful and important he says wala ta'jaz don't give up don't stop one of the things that stops us the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said yustajabu li ahadikum ma lam yu'ajjib he says you will be responded to as long as you are not hasty as long as you're not hasty and they said well what is haste he says that a person says i made dua and it was not responded to me and so make dua today and tomorrow and the day after and the day after that and after ramadan is over continue to make dua 
and don't give up on your dua. Don't stop. Persevere. Endure. You know, yesterday was the 16th, so a lot of people uh, have been sharing, of course, and, and have read by now that beautiful passage right at the beginning of Surah Maryam, where Zakariya alayhi salam, the scene of, of Surah Maryam, the first scene in Surah Maryam is, is describing this, this prophet has, that has been weathered by age. He's an old man now. His hair is white and his bones have become frail and his wife has become barren. And he is saying, My Lord, I never lose when I make dua to you. And so the question that I have for you now is, Zakaria is asking Allah for a son. Zakaria is asking Allah for a son, even though he has literally checked every reason why he shouldn't have a son. I'm old, I'm really frail now. My wife, she's barren now, but I never lose when I make dua to you, Ya Rab. So grant me a son. Do you think that the first time Zakaria made dua for a son is when he had reached that old level? That old age, that level of old age, is that the first time where he thought to himself, you know what, it would be good to have a son? Or has he been making that dua for decades? Has he been making that dua for decades? But he's not giving up. This is my dua. This is what I want. Ya Rab. And I don't lose when I make dua to you. And so grant me a son. Grant me a son. And this is a really important lesson as well, is that sometimes... You might have something that you want really, really badly. You want really, really badly. You have the brother who's been trying to get married for years. Sister's been trying to get married for years. Or maybe it's the couple that's been trying to have children for years. And at some point, you might think to yourself, you know what? I'm not going to make du'a for it this Ramadan because it's just... It's been too painful. Last Ramadan, I did it. And the year before, I did it. And I went to Hajj and I did it. And I stood on Arafah and I cried my eyes out. And up until now, it just has it. And you know what? Maybe I should just come to terms with the fact that this just might not be my destiny. I am saying to you, don't lower what you want. Raise your dua. Make it more powerful. Make it more energetic cry even harder, beg a lot even more from because of a number of reasons. Number one, dua, dua changes things. Dua is one of the most effective means for you to get whatever it is that you want. But number two, even from an as, aspect of worship, this pure worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there might not be anything that you offer in your life that is more powerful and act of worship than the dua of a heart that is breaking. The dua of a person who wants something so badly and they are begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. It may be that if in Allah's divine wisdom, it's, it never comes to you. On the day of judgment, when your deeds are placed on a scale, it may be that those duas that you were making for an entire lifetime will be your reason to enter into paradise. Those emotional du'as, that hope, that love, that, that, that not giving up, that could be what enters you into paradise. Zakaria says, and I never lose when I make du'a for you. Every du'a is answered, but they are answered in different ways. <clears throat> sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives it to you as you want it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sometimes it is delayed for you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees in His wisdom, His perfect knowledge, that you receiving it in this moment is not what is best for you. There might be something that is even better. Or three, that dua is used to save you in this life from something else. And so you have some calamity that was destined for you, but you're making dua to get married and that dua then gets transferred over to protect you from this ailment or this disease or this car accident or this poverty or such and such. And so dua always, always uh, becomes a reason of goodness in this life and in the next. So these are three things. Now, if I can add, from the hadith. If I can add a few other just points 
Number one is the Prophet وسلم, he says, Ud'u Allah wa antum muqinuna bil ijaba. Number four is certainty. Number four is certainty. That a person when they make dua, they make dua and they are certain. They know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to respond to them. That a person not say things like, Oh Allah, if you wish. The Prophet وسلم, said, Don't say that because you're not going to force Allah anyway. So don't say if you wish, do this or do that. No. Ask Allah. With certainty. Oh Allah, grant me. Oh Allah, give me. That's number four. Number five. That the most, to, to, to embark on the etiquettes of dua. And the etiquettes of dua are many. And you can, you can, you know, read a lot of books on the etiquettes of dua. You can, I'm sure Sheikh Yasser Qadi has a, a book called uh, Dua, The Weapon of the Believer. You can check that out. I'm sure there's a passage there about the etiquettes of dua. But, Allah, uh, that Prophet ﷺ mentions a lot of etiquettes, and I have them compiled in a in a short poem that you can find if you look up my dua album on YouTube. Just look up Ammar Shukri dua album on YouTube. You'll find a passage that says the etiquettes of dua, and it goes, "Make still your heart." So the first condition is the presence of heart. Let it be, make still your heart. As you talk to the king of kings, let it be broken for words spoken are not token when hearts bleed from shattered things. Let it be broken. Let your heart be present and broken because words spoken are not token when hearts bleed from shattered things. The things that you are saying in that moment, in that fear, even if you're stumbling, even if you're, the words aren't coming out right, Words spoken are not token when hearts bleed from shattered things. Words spoken. So these, when your heart is shattered, this is the most important. The inkisar, literally, that brokenness is what is intended from dua. That is how it is an act of worship. Because you recognize, oh Allah, I can't, you can. I am transferring whatever this issue is from my limited power and ability to the power and ability of Allah. And how beautiful is that? And raise your hands, for no hands return to him empty-handed, and send praises upon the Prophet that are beautiful and expanded, and seek entrance before you begin by seeking forgiveness from every sin, and beg and implore, and then implore some more. Do not by delay be defeated, for he loves for our words to be repeated and entrance to be entreated. And so, Raising your hands to the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith of Salman al-Farisi, he says that your Lord is shy and generous. He is shy that when these hands go up, that he allows them to go back down empty-handed and that you send salam upon the Prophet ﷺ and that you praise Allah before you do so as well. So you say, Alhamdulillah. And even if you just recite Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Fatiha is a dua. Ihdina Salat Al-Mustaqeem. That is a dua that you make. But before you make the dua, what are you saying? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Malik Yawbiddin. You are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because even when you, there always has to be an introduction before a request. Even when you call up a friend, and you're about to make a request. You're calling them for a request. But what do you do? Do you just say, hey, salam alaikum. Can you give me a ride home? You don't do that, right? Your friend, you just say, salam alaikum. Hey, how's it going? Right? Before you ask for money, right? before you need to borrow money from them. You don't say, salam, you know, salam alaikum, can I borrow money? You're like, salam alaikum. How are you doing? How, long time no see, man. How's everything? How's work? How's your, right? You have to do an introduction. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that praise is the introduction. That's how you enter into the audience with the king. That praise. And in any case, and raise your hands because no hands go deck down empty handed and send blessings upon the Prophet that are beautiful and expanded and seek entrance before you begin by seeking forgiveness for every sin. And so beginning by making istighfar and then begging and poor and then implore some more. Again, this goes back to that notion that we talked about that the Prophet وسلم, says that it is responded to you as long as you are not hasty and do not by delay be defeated. Allah loves al-ilhah. He loves that we continue and continue and continue to implore him and ask him. And there are a number of other etiquettes of them, of course, is by beginning with or using Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes are there for the purpose of dua. Allah says, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ husna فَادْعُوهُ بِهَا In Surah Al-Ahzab. Uh, sorry, Surah Al-A'raf. He says, and to Allah belong the most beautiful names, so call upon him by those names. 
And so these names that we know of are because and for the purpose of making dua. And so remember to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for uh, by his beautiful names and attributes that you, if you're asking for mercy, that you ask Allah by his name, Ar-Rahman. If you're asking for risk and provision and financial security, that you ask Allah by his name, Ar-Razaq or Al-Mu'min, the one who grants safety and security or Al-Wahhab, the one who bestows and gifts. If you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, for marriage or for children, a beautiful name is Al-Wahhab because we see many times that the word hiba is tied to spouses and children in the Quran. رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا لِأَهَبْ لَكِ غُلَامٍ زَكِيَا فَهَبْ لِي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ وَلِيَا Again and again and again we see this request for children from the prophets who are using this word. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his name Al-Wahhab. And I am uh, teaching in uh, online and it's free and I would encourage you to join if you have the ability to do so. Uh, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, short uh, sessions on some of the names of Allah in a program that we're doing with the Maghrib Institute called Ramadan 360. Now, Ramadan 360 is a, a, a really beautiful uh, virtual community that we've created because of people, you know, all of us really not having access to our masajid during Ramadan. And so we wanted to create this place. And then, alhamdulillah, we have almost 10,000 people on Facebook sharing gems and and you know showing pictures and doing challenges together and communicating and getting advice from each other on what to do with our kids during Ramadan and all of this it's a very engaged group and we have these daily sessions three or four daily sessions happening every day and I am doing a weekly session on the names of Allah and I would love for you all to join us but in any case I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you can check it out at ramadan360.org but in any case, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to uh, not make for us a dua except that it is accepted and no uh, hum or, or, or stress except that it, is, uh, that it is lifted from us and no debt except that it is repelled uh, or that it is taken care of uh, for us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no sick except that they are healed. And no deceased except that they have been uh, experienced mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that their reception be beautified by him and no need of ours except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it easy for us and facilitated it for us by his, by his mercy and his benevolence and his generosity. Jazakumullah khair. I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts from all of you your fasting and your charity and your qiyam and your recitation of the Qur'an. Ramadan has always been about the Qur'an, spirituality, and community. We fast together, break our fast together, pray together, and celebrate together. And it always comes at the right time and feeds your mind, body, and soul. But how can we do all of that in quarantine? For the most unique Ramadan we've ever experienced, the most unique experience we've ever launched. Ramadan 360 a global community experiencing Ramadan together to feed your mind, body, and soul. Barakallahu feek, Sheikh. May Allah bless you and your family and keep them safe in unprecedented times. Uh, and subhanAllah, uh, what an amazing advice you've given about dua. And I ask Allah that we can take benefit from these words uh, and inshallah we can establish a greater connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and cry out our hearts to Allah and ask Allah for everything that we wish and we desire. We ask Allah that he gives us the best in this life but most importantly the best uh, in the next, subhanAllah. So my dear brothers and sisters, who am I going to be introducing now? It's that sheikh who is known uh, for story time, for family story time. And that is none other than our dear Sheikh, Sheikh Asim Khan. And subhanAllah, he tells us beautiful stories in a way which is palatable and is nice for not only the children, but the teenage, but also the adults and those older than the adults, our elderly brothers and sisters, subhanAllah. If you want to find out more from him, again, you can go into online masjid, you can go into his YouTube page, his social media, uh, and wherever you may find him on online platforms. So without further ado, I want to uh, ask our dear Sheikh, Sheikh Asim Khan to come forward to tell us about how we can maximize the night of the nights of Ramadan and in particular the nights of Layl, the night of Laylatul Qadr. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa ala ashraf al anbiya al mursaleen nabina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. 
Once again, brothers and sisters out there, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I pray you're well and I pray that you are feeling excited because I am. I'm feeling excited because Ramadan is special and it just gets extra special towards the end. The last 10 nights in it is Laylatul Qadr, the night power, the night of blessing, the night of majesty. And that night, it is really like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending a lifeline to humanity that if they were just to grab onto this one night with worship and sincerity and devotion, that they will be rescued from the hellfire and they will be granted eternal peace in the hereafter. We ask Allah to count us amongst us people. But really and truly that night is that important. And one of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, allow us to increase our estimation of this night is by is is through the revelation of a surah in which he spoke only about the blessing of this one night and there's no other night uh, that Allah spoke about you know with just one surah as he has done with Laylatul Qadr like the night for example Isra al Mi'raj the night where the person went on the night journey we have Surah Al Isra also known as Surah Al Bani Israel but it doesn't exclusively talk about the night journey, in fact, only a small part of it does. As for, Layl, uh, as for Surah Al-Qadr, from the beginning until the end, it is all about this blessed night. So let's have a little look at this surah to see how we can reevaluate our appreciation of this night. And then, inshallah, I'm going to share with you some practical tips on how to stay awake firstly for this night, but also how to take advantage of this night, how to stay motivated, how to stay inspired, and how to really try to, uh, you know, uh, make the most of this special time. So if we go to Surah Al-Qadr, we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرٌ مِّنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed, we sent it down on the night of Qadr. And the word Qadr itself, though we translate it as power, it can also mean decree. It can also mean something of great value. The Arabs would say, Rajulun lahu dhu qadr. There is a man amongst us, he has great value, great station and position. So therefore, it would be the night of great value. That's another translation. We could also, the other meaning of qadr is uh, for something to be blessed for something to be uh, and subhanallah in, in another place in the Quran Allah actually says indeed we sent it down in the night of blessing so now we know Laylatul Qadr can also mean the night of blessing and it is it's, it's a night of all these things it's a night of power it's a night of decree it's a night of blessing it's a night of great virtue but how can we really understand how special it is like yeah I get it it's good it's nice. Allah, you know, wants us to respect that night. But how can we truly understand how amazing it is? Well, Allah says inside the surah, Laylatul Qadr khayrun min alfi shahr. That the night of power, the night of honor, the night of blessing is better than a thousand months. What does that mean? It means that if you were to worship Allah in this one night, it would calculate to being equivalent to having worshipped Allah every single night for 84 years. In fact, even more than 84 years, because a thousand months is is like is the is is the equivalent of 30,000 days. 30,000 days. It's like you got up for 30,000 nights, and what did you do in that night? You spent it worshipping Allah, reading Quran, making dua, making dhikr, uh, making dua reading Qiyamul Layl, it's like you did all of that every single night for 30,000 nights. That is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he lifts our estimation of this night. Interestingly, they say that there's a narration from Mujahid, who's a famous student of Ibn Abbas, um, who said that once upon a time in Bani Israel, the Israelites, those are the people of Musa alayhi salam, that there was a man who was very pious and what he would do, his habit, which is amazing, is that he would spend the night praying to Allah, making qiyam or layl, tahajjud as we call it, and then in the daytime he would put on his armor and he would fight with the believing forces in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against the enemy. So in the nighttime he's doing something amazing, 
in the daytime he's doing something amazing and on top of that he ended up doing that every day of his life for a thousand mm. months essentially you know 85 years and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a gift to the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu he made it easy for us to attain that level by saying well you don't have to do it for 84 years mm. just do it for one night mm. just do it on the night of Qadr subhanallah so imagine that Imagine how how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the Ummah of Muhammad that he allowed them that you know what just spend this one night and I'll I'll make it calculate to the same as that man from Bani Israel, subhanallah al Adeem. And to break it down further, you know, there's no other place in the Quran where Allah will define a day or a night being like a certain number of months or days or years um from from the from the nights of this world anyway. Um, so why did Allah say the th- a thousand months? Is it? It's in a way. It's is to show us how um, miserable somebody should feel if they wasted that night. You know, it's not just the night you waste. You wasted a, like a thousand months there. Do you, do you understand what just happened there? And in the hadith, the person would say, you know, later al Qadr. خير من ألف شر فمن حرم منها فقد حرم. That the length of Qadr is better than a thousand months, and whoever is deprived of it, truly he's been deprived. Like you've lost out so much. It's like you know, you uh, let's say you know you had shares in a business, and you're like today you know I'm going to sell those shares, and you got your price for it. But then the day after, the day after, they quadrupled. In fact, they went up by tenfold. And had you just waited that one day, you would have become a multi-millionaire. But you lost out. In the same way, that devastation is how you should feel that if you had, you know, slept that whole night and wasted that night. And inshallah, we won't. Inshallah, Allah give us the ufiq to really maximize that time. So this is what I want to do now. I want to share with you uh, ways in which we can maximize our experience in that in, in these nights. So essentially, there are, there are six acts of worship that you can do. Okay, six acts of worship, and if you what what you can do is you can make a plan to like diversify and and create a variety of worship in order to keep yourself alert, in order to keep yourself motivated. And if you you know you can't spend the whole night praying qiyamul layl, maybe some people can, but some people find it too difficult. I don't know enough surahs, for example, to read the hajjud for the entire night. Okay, no problem. Try doing this. So what you can do is you'll start off, for example, the first thing you can do is to um, engage in some recitation of Qur'an. After all, it is a night where Allah revealed the Qur'an. It makes sense then to read the Qur'an more as well. Okay, so you sit down, open the Mus'haf, and you start to read. And when you're reading, you know, uh, get into a nice flow, recite nice and loudly. No, don't disturb other people. Recite it loudly so you can hear the Qur'an, experience the Qur'an with your ears as well as your eyes. And then, you know, get a translation out there uh, and read some of the translation of what you read. I'm telling you, it affects the heart. When you read what it actually means, you're like, subhanAllah, I didn't know that. I wasn't aware of that. This is amazing. So now you've got some Quran going on, but then you get tired, you know. Uh, we all get tired. Shaitan sometimes, you know, makes us feel more tired than we are. That kind of thing happens all the time, right? So you read some Quran, you're feeling spiritual, you're feeling like, you know, I made a connection with Allah through the Quran. Fantastic. What's the next thing I could do? Right, let me make some dhikr. After all, you know, making dhikr tonight would be like making dhikr for 85 years almost of my life. So let me sit down on the prayer mat, let me get some prayer beads, let me get the, you know, you could use your fingers, you could use a machine, whatever it is, and give yourself some targets. So this is a little tip here. Don't say, let me just do some dhikr, say alhamdulillah, sometime for a certain amount of time, subhanAllah, a certain amount of time, la ilaha illallah, a certain amount of time. No, say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say la ilaha illallah a thousand times. That's my target. And by giving yourself a thousand target, it allows you to motivate yourself, to stay focused. And you know how human beings are, when they start to get to the finishing line, that's when they start to really get more determined, more steadfast. And so it's not that a thousand times is the special number, but rather it's the process that makes it special and that allows you to do more. And that's what we want to do. We want to do more and more and more. You know, from the amazing adhkar that you can say is subhanallah wa bihamdi wa subhanallah al Because the Prophet said, these are kalimatan, they are two words, uh, you know, they are very light on the tongue, but thaqilatan, they are very heavy on the mizan, on the scale. Meaning, on the day of judgment, when those 
thousand subhanallah al azim subhanallah wa bihamdi are taken and placed on the scales the scales will have whoosh you know they'll come crashing down because the weight of those words is just so heavy so much value allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give those words so spending time now sitting making dhikr of allah with your thousand targets fantastic okay i'm getting a bit tired i mean i'm getting a bit restless what should i do okay no problem relax close your eyes but why don't you play the quran put the quran on take some beautiful recitation put it on youtube whatever it is and listen to it and at least you're listening to quran at that time yeah you're relaxing but you're still getting reward you're still listening to the quran subhanallah and even the quran may melt your heart to make it even softer and tender and feeling closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then what can you do well now you can stand to pray qiyamul layl stand make wudu again you know refresh your wudu you're feeling tired it's a great way to splash some water on your face you get the reward of wudu you get the reward of forgiveness where you know the person said that every drop that falls off you from the wudu water so too do your sins fall off uh, with it allahu akbar now you're fresh you're pure stand for qiyamul layl praying two rak'ah praying another two rak'ah pray another two rak'ah okay i've prayed now what should i do next no problem now is the time to make dua this is the night in which your dreams come true what what should i ask for it's okay because before the laylatul qadr came you were already prepared a beautiful dua list a dua plan in which you t- you spoke about the things that you want to ask allah for that you want to ask allah for yourself your parents your family your kids your future you spoke about in that you know you're going to talk about the mistakes you made in your past or oh allah i made that mistake please forgive me i made that mistake please forgive me oh allah you know i did this this wasn't right please forgive me and then you've got the names of people that you want to make dua for your friends your family your work colleagues your neighbors uh you know people in your life that they deserve you know some dua time from you no of course they do but you always it always slips your mind but now you've got it there on a piece of paper or you can have it on your phone and you know you 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 slowly you start to dawn on you that you know I don't even have enough time to make dua for all these people for all of these things but that's what you want you want to fill that time so that you know you're just like going from one worship to another worship and you know alhamdulillah this is really coming along now you you you're getting close to the finishing line you're like you know I need to start making preparation for suhoor and to get those pancakes on the pan alhamdulillah you know and to start fasting and that's what we want but there's something else you can do the sixth thing you can do is you can give some sadaqa yes you can give some sadaqa and giving sadaqa on that night is like giving sadaqa uh, every single night for you know eight, for what would we say 30000 nights 30000 nights worth of sadaqa is on hand here so even if you gave it one pound is like you gave 30000 pounds you know then that's not even taking in the multiplication factor of 10 for hasanat and then ramadan multiplication factor that takes it up to you know times by 700 so the numbers are getting crazy now right so giving some sadaqa go online you know you can even have a charity box at home you know it doesn't have to go directly to the poor person at that moment in time it's just the act of taking the money with the intention putting it in the box and saying allah this 10 pounds is 100 pounds this is for sadaqa and who, tomorrow someone's going to come and they're going to take it or whatever and inshallah that will go down as a sadaqa or you can go online and you can make a donation so there's so many amazing things that you can do and we know that one of the duas that you should make on laylatul qadr is the dua that the person he taught uh, aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha uh, and, and 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 this dua subhanallah we it's such a small dua but it is so powerful and uh, i always I'm, i'm always amazed that on such a great night you know people may think they have to do extraordinary things to get allah's favor and to get their duas answered but uh, you know the prophet sallam he taught us a dua that is so small it reflects the generosity and the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know um, and and aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha she asked the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know on this auspicious night what should we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for <clears throat> what dua should we make and the prophet sallam said say اللهم انك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم انك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا um what does that mean it means oh allah you are the one who pardons and you don't just pardon تحب العفو you actually love to pardon so pardon me 
And this is amazing. It's three simple things. You're saying, number one, Allah, you are afu. And afu uh, means the one, some say, that is able to not just forgive, uh, not even forget, but to erase, to blot out, to delete, as if it didn't happen in the first place. Allah, you have the power to do that with my mistakes. The, the things that I've done wrong in my life that haunt me, that make me feel guilty, that make me feel like I can't come close to you, that make me feel like I can't recommit myself to you. You have the power to take those things and to make them vanish as if they'd never happened. And it's not that you, you know, do that begrudgingly or you do that and you would rather not do that. But to hibbul afwa, you actually love to do that. You are... <clears throat> You know, you, you, you desire to do that. You want to do that. It makes you pleased to take my mistakes, the things that I did to once earn your anger, and to make them disappear. You know, no human being is like this. When somebody does something really horrible to you, and they ask you sincerely, please forgive me, the best of us may let it slide. But there'll always be a memory there. You know, you did that, I remember that. And maybe in the future, even though you've forgiven, you might have a slight argument. And in that moment of heat, you know, that once upon a time mistake creeps back up again. And it makes you, you know, it makes, it taints your view of that person. Like, you're the same person who did that to me a long time ago. I remember that. Yeah, I forgave you. And that person, in their mind, they're like, did they really forgive me? Like, is it going to come up again later on? And did they really let go of it? You know, subhanAllah, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can, you can rest assured that if Allah, you know, because he's afu, if he pardons you, it's a done deal and it's forgotten about. You know, how amazing is that? So you say, Allah ma'inaka afuun, that you are the one who deletes or erases or makes sins vanish. And you love doing that. So then what's next? Fa'fu anni, which means do that with me, Allah. Pardon me, Allah. Fa'fu anna would mean the collective. So then do that with all of us. You know, and you can intend different people, Fa'fu anna. So do that, pardon me, my family, my kids, you know, my parents, who anybody that you wish to include in that, hopefully you maybe include me in that as well, inshallah. The Ummah, inshallah. You know, and and uh, this is so beautiful. And you may think, well, that's a small do I can do that. Fantastic. Repeat it. Repeat it a thousand times. Just like I said with the dhikr, repeat it a thousand times. Have that count that, you know what, I'm going to say this dua a thousand times. And when Allah sees you knocking a thousand times, do you think Allah is going to reject you? Asking Allah, if you ask someone three times, they'll be like, you know, out of embarrassment, man, let me just help this person. He's asked me so many times, right? <laughs> Somebody messages you, please, can you do this for me, bro? You're like, okay, later on, they message you again. You're like, okay, and the third time, okay, fair enough. Just, okay, I'll do it for you. You know, repeating a thousand times, Allah, Allah ma inna ka'fu wa tuhibu al-a'fu fa'afu anni, fa'afu anni, fa'afu anni. And you're crying. You know, these tears are streaming down your cheeks. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees that. Allah witnesses that. Allah loves that. And that is what we want. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes of those who maximize our time in these last ten nights. It could be in any one of these last ten nights. We ask Allah for tawfiq, to stay awake, to stay motivated, and to be sincere. May Allah accept it from you. May Allah accept it from me. May Allah accept it from all of us. Wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. So my dear brothers and sisters, we have our next Sheikh, Sheikh Kamal al makyu hails all the way from the US. But before we go on to him, I want to mention something special to you. And I want... Uh, to invite you to something very special. Our partners this evening, the Muslim Research and Development Foundation, who is a great charity and does amazing work, wants a message for you this Ramadan, and it wants you to have potentially the opportunity through uh, your sadaqah, through your dua, through your support, to make a difference in this life and the next.
Wouldn't it be amazing to be in a position to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and say, Ya Allah, I wasn't a person who merely complained about the status quo of the ummah and whined. I was a person who supported the scholars of the religion. I made projects and I supported them as well. I was a person, Ya Rabb, who not only wanted to change what is within myself, but I also then after doing that, I wanted to change others and benefit them. Is it not a dream come true to be able to say such words? Make it a reality dear brothers and sisters. Thousands of Muslims all across the world have benefited from our projects, alhamdulillah, and we want to be able to continue to do so and we want you to share in the reward. Your money creates Muslims who benefit other Muslims, who go on to benefit other Muslims, creating a domino effect for your donation. And at this moment in time, we require 1,000 people to donate 100 pound each to help us reach our goal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you a means of guidance. Please, please, my dear brothers and sisters, if you can donate whatever you can, but at a minimum, try to be one of those thousand special people who will give just a hundred pound and make a difference to the work that MRDF does. This very organization, Family Iftar, Family Events, is a supported project of MRDF. And you can see where all of this head is going to, the number of lives that are being touched, all because of the work that MRDF does in cultivating people, in building leaders, and subhanAllah providing guidance. So please, please, I ask you again and urge you again, please do come forward and support uh, MRDF in the work that they're doing. And how you can do that, you can go to support.mrdf.co.uk. So without further ado, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask our dear Sheikh, Sheikh Kamal, all the way from America, uh, to tell us, how can we have fun this evening? Sheikh, are you going to tell us? <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-ameen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Amma ba'd. So I'm here to talk to you about making Eid fun for the family. Now, in this lecture, I'm going to give you a detailed program that involves kayaking, skydiving, and doing all kinds of fun activities on the day of Eid. I'm just kidding. <laughs> of course not. I'm going to give you some, some of the guidelines that will make Eid or, or some of the things people do that make Eid not fun. How about that? And evidence that Eid is supposed to be fun and it is a day when, in general, it's, uh, things are a bit more relaxed and you can get away with some to a degree, some. So let's start with this hadith. And this is the, the main hadith that scholars use to indicate that the, the day of Eid is unlike the other days. It's a different day. And therefore, you're able to do things that you would not be able to do on any other day of the year. On the day of Eid, you're allowed to have happiness. And, uh, and it, we said it's exempt from things that you can't do other, on other days. The evidence we have is this hadith of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Famous hadith of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu entering upon Aisha, his daughter, or entering into the home slash room of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But let me go a little bit before Abu Bakr enters that. From another narration we see, so Aisha radiallahu anha, she had two jariyatayn. A jariya is anywhere from like the age of seven, eight, that's a jariya. And there's, we have a narration of Aisha saying that when a woman is, when a girl reaches nine, she's a woman. So, so that means the jariya is really young at that young age. And they were two, these two young girls were singing. They were using an instrument known as the duf, which is like uh, almost like a, a tambourine, but without the rattles. So it's a stretched out piece of leather and they were beating on that. And when the Prophet saw them, so, so they stopped. They saw the, the Prophet, so they ent the Prophet entered his own home and they were there. When they saw him, they stopped. So the Prophet allowed them to continue. He told them to continue. And then he went and he lay down. Aisha radiallahu anhu said, وَالطَّجْعَ فِي جَانِبِ الْبَيْتِ So he went and laid down in a side of the a, a room or the house. وَغَطَّ وَجْهَهُ And then he covered his face. So that's number one. They were embarrassed when the Prophet walked in. And one of, part of his good manners is that he went somewhere else and he covered his face. So they don't feel embarrassed and he's not like staring at them, looking at them. So they continued. Then we get to this other narration here where Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu enters and he finds Aisha radiallahu anhu sitting with these two jariyatayn, these two young girls, and they're beating the duf, and they're singing songs 
from Yom Bu'ath, from the day of Bu'ath. It's a day of, of, of a battle and heroics. So they're not singing anything, any lyrics that are anywhere comparable to what we have today. Despite all that, Abu Bakr anhu, he said, Amizmaru shaytan fi bayti Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the mizmar, the flute of the shaytan in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the scholar said this indicates to you that uh, a lot of, or the companions of the Prophet sallam, understood and knew that music and this uh, was haram. But here in this case, of course, they're just using the duf and they're two young girls and they're singing songs of heroics and battles. So the Prophet ﷺ then uncovers his head and he says, Da'huma ya Abu Bakr. He says, Leave them, يعني meaning let them do this, Ya Abu Bakr. فَإِنَّنَا فِي يَوْمِ عِيدٍ In this narration, we are in a day of Eid. So the scholar said, it indicates why this exemption was made because it was a day of Eid. Today, you can do things, it'll be, it's more relaxed than any other time. Now, Abu Bakr was at the default, the asl, which is, that would not be acceptable. That's why he frowned upon that. And the Prophet ﷺ showed them the exception was due to the fact that it is a day of Eid. And from here, the scholar said, if it's a wedding, if it's any kind of like an engagement and uh, they bring out a duf, then it's acceptable. Now, a duf does not mean percussion instruments where someone will bring a whole drum set and go from one end to the other because uh, the duf is allowed. The duf is completely different here. Now, what's interesting, there were two young girls. And we cannot use this hadith to, uh, like it's a green light to go listen to uh, adult women singing. They were jariyatain. Yani there were two young girls, seven, eight years old, what have you, even up to nine, no problem. Then they were not really using musical instruments. It was just the duf. And they were singing the heroics of the day of Bu'ath. So it is um, not yani, descriptive, describing a woman's body. Yani, these new songs now, they're describing a woman's body so much that you have to lower your gaze just from, just from their song, from their lyrics. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, when the Abyssinians came, they came to his masjid ﷺ, and they were doing a display with their spears. And, and the Prophet ﷺ was uh, encouraging people and he was saying, يهود أن في ديننا فسحة. He says, and so the Jews, so that the Jews will know that in our religion there is fusha, meaning there is room, that it's there is opportunity for relaxing and being happy and having some fun, that it's not all the way strict and there is no room for any fun. Now, and he also allowed Aisha to watch. He asked her, would you like to watch? And then she put her chin on his shoulder, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and her cheek against his cheek, and she kept watching. And then he would ask her, have you had enough? And she would say no. And then he would ask her, have you had enough? And she would say no. And then later on, she admits that I had had enough, but I just wanted to see my place with the Prophet ﷺ. We're seeing all this being allowed here. Now, once again, this is not a green light that anything goes on a day of Eid, but this is the ceiling. This is the level. You know, this is as high as we can go. So some of the things now that ruin the happiness of the day of Eid. Number one, everybody try to break your fast on the same day. I'm talking about the same family. And one of the worst things that can ruin Eid is if the father, and this has happened before, the father is fasting, okay? The mother is having Eid and the son had Eid yesterday. There was a family like this with three people and each one of them had something different. So, okay, how do we, how do we fix this problem? One of the ways is to try as much as possible to behave as if when you're in a Muslim country. Like if you're fasting, you live in Saudi and you're fasting there. And then they announce Eid is tomorrow. What do you do? And that's it. True or false? If you're living in Morocco and they say Eid is Wednesday. Oh, subhanAllah, we're going to miss Ramadan. True or false? Pick any Muslim country in the world. You're living in Pakistan, you're living in India. And then someone says, you know, the government announces Eid is tomorrow. Oh, congratulations, let me get the Eid clothes ready. True or false? Not, not once, if you right now go and spend Ramadan in a Muslim country and they say Eid is Wednesday, you're like, why Wednesday? Let me do my own Googling and let me find a group who's doing it on Tuesday. And what's the argument for Wednesday? You don't care about that. Because there's 
in a way, some kind of amir, some kind of governing body, someone in charge. And when they say for the, to the believers, this is the day of Eid, everybody has Eid on that day. But what happens in the West when we don't have this one ruling group or party or what have you, or authority, uh, authoritative figure, we, we become the Sheikh, the Mufti, and Sheikh al-Islam and everybody else. So what happens? Eid is Wednesday. Eid is Wednesday. Yalla, let me go and consult Google. And let me, let me find someone who says it's Thursday. Yalla. And then we start posting it and sending it to each other. And this and Morocco said Wednesday. What do you care about Morocco? <laughs> Morocco is Wednesday. And, and this group of Pakistan is Tuesday. Who told, who told you to be Mr. Global Moonsighting guy? So what's the nearest equivalent? What's the closest thing to the local authority? And that is, what is the majority in your city going with, all right? Even if there are two, two different narrations in your city, one says Wednesday, one says Thursday, what would be the majority here? What are the majority of the masajid going? And just pretend like you live in a Muslim country and go with the majority. Now, I know that none of this will make any sense because I've seen the level of fighting in the UK. I spent one, the end of one Ramadan in the UK and it, I got there in the last 10 all right, for Atikaf. I got there in the last 10 and people were still fighting in front of me about when Ramadan started. So I know it's another level in the UK, but do your best to behave as if you're in a Muslim country and go with what is the majority. All right, and, and, and as a family especially, try to break uh, your, your iftar together. I mean, you know, start Eid together. It's the worst thing when half the family Eid is today and the other half Eid is tomorrow. So this group is smiling and trying to be happy and the other group is frowning because they're still hungry. And then tomorrow they're happy and the other ones, the happiness died down. What a disaster. And by the way, part of good manners is that even if, you, if it happens that your Eid is one day and the other person's Eid is another day and they come to you and it happened one time here in America and uh, I was with a group where that had, I think the earlier, I can't remember, the earlier Eid or something like that. And then the other group would, next day had their Eid. And they'll tell you Eid Mubarak. What do you tell them? We had Eid yesterday. You should tell them Eid Mubarak and smile. And they didn't ask you when was your Eid. They just said Eid Mubarak. Smile and no, no, Eid was yesterday. It's over. Or people are having Eid today. And you believe it's 100% wrong. You're still fasting. All right? And they're having Eid today. They come to you smiling. Eid Mubarak. I'm fasting. Eid for me is tomorrow. You don't have to do that. That's not necessary. Always pick the option where you're nice to people. Always pick the option where you enter happiness into people's hearts, you know? So do that. It doesn't matter if you're fasting or not, but that's, the whole, that's a big thing that will ruin the happiness on the day of Eid. The other thing is that our religion is a beautiful religion. It's a balanced religion. And just like we have a lot of hadith and, and statements and ayat that praise crying, out of taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aynani la tamassuhuma annar. Two eyes that will not be touched by the hellfire. One of them, an eye that cried out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're, our religion praises crying, but at the, in other places and at other times, it praises happiness and celebration. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to Al Madina, he found them celebrating many, many different Eids and celebrations, and he narrowed it down to two official ones, Eid al Fitr and Eid al-Adha. These are our two official days of happiness. And so it is our, it is, it behooves us then to make this a day of happiness for ourselves and for our family. Now, sometimes someone might look in books and find that the, the early Muslims, um, or the, the early Muslims during Eid, and you will read the narration that this, they came into one of the Salaf, one of the early Muslims, and they found him crying. And they said, why are you crying? And he says, I miss Ramadan and I miss Qiyam. Another narration will mention that they found this other person. He was also sad and crying on the day of Eid. And they said, what is it? He says, how can I be happy? I don't know if I have been forgiven in Ramadan or not. And if my fast has been accepted or not. Now, a number of things. Number one, first and foremost, most important thing. The Prophet wasallam was happy on the day of Eid. And Abu Bakr was happy on the day of Eid. And Umar was happy on the day of Eid. You're not going to come and tell me, I can't be happy on this day. I don't know if I've been forgiven or not. Neither did Umar anhu. But he expressed happiness on this day. That's the first thing. All right? This, and 
and Khairu al-Hadi Hadi Muhammad. The best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he was happy on this day and you were supposed to be happy on this day. Now the other thing is also these narrations from righteous people before us who were crying on the day of Eid. This could have been a moment. Okay, first of all, there were hundreds of thousands of people who were alive. And then you have like six or seven narrations of someone crying. That's one. Two, it could be that this is just a moment when they were sad and crying, but they were happy for the rest of the day. Yeah, you caught them at that moment when they were crying, that made it to the book and the narration. And then the rest of the day they were happy and, and eating lamb and kebab and everything and nobody said anything, right? So, um, that's, so the idea is that this is not the day of sadness. All right, something else that happens. And I understand that, you know, the world is different today in Corona and even having a Eid gathering will not happen to maj the majority of Muslims around the world. But it's never a reason to make this specifically a day of sadness. And some of us have lost family members during Ramadan and right before Ramadan due to this virus. So then when Eid comes, this will be our first Eid without them. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala en envelop them in, in the His mercy subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the thing is that uh, we don't purposely single out Eid as a day to remember who's here and who's not here with us. And this happens a lot. And now some countries have this as a thing where it's your first Eid without that person. And they start the morning of Eid with a lot of crying. And, and I used to see that as a child. And it used to be kind of very scary and shocking to us. Like, why is everybody crying? It's a day of Eid and it's a day of, day of happiness. Um, that's what it's for. It's not to remember deceased family members and things like that. And it's also not the kid's fault, you know, like, you know, how can I be happy when the ummah is suffering with the coronavirus? Type? Your kids, that's not their fault. And it's, do you want to be honest, it's not even their concern right now. They're eight years old, it's eight, they don't know what gifts you brought them. Okay, don't tell them this eight, we're going to be mourning because of the virus. What virus? All right. Taib. Now, um, so going back to the issue of you know, we just got through with Ramadan. And did we change in Ramadan or not? Did And that's the whole point of the month of Ramadan, right? That it became a little better in prayer, in dhikr, in controlling our temper, whatever it is. You know, if someone were to ask your wife, has he changed? What will she say? Yes, alhamdulillah. He changed in manners and he changed in dhikr. He's praying on time. He's going to the masjid. Or she'd be like, yes, of course he changed in Ramadan. He lost three kilos. His gut used to be up to here. Now it's back here. <laughs> All right. Um, but, okay, what does this have to do with Eid and happiness during Eid, whether you change in Ramadan or not? Well, one of the things is that you may hear this as a very famous statement. They tell you that one of the signs that your good deeds were accepted in Ramadan is that you remain upon what you were upon in Ramadan. And, and, and it was really popular. I even when I was younger, I used to say it in khutab and stuff. But then I found that this is actually not correct and it's not accurate either. And all it does is it'll make people feel like failures. So how can I enjoy my Eid if you made me feel like a failure? You know, if, if I don't remain upon how I was in Ramadan, for the rest of the year, that means Allah didn't accept my fast. All right. First of all, the scholar said, nobody is exactly how he is outside of Ramadan like he was in Ramadan. They said evidence and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself was, took it to another level in Ramadan as opposed to the rest of the year. And then within the last 10 nights of Ramadan, took it to another level. As you know, the, they described that he would tighten his belt and he would wake up his family members. So even in the last 10, he took it to another level than the first 20. So that means when, when Eid comes or Ramadan ends, the Prophet would go to where, which is still high, he was for the rest of the year. And though it's not re a realistic expectation where you want to remain at that level, but you're going to do your best. Here are the two extremes. One extreme is to think that people will remain that way the entire time and even on the day of Eid. And by the way, proof that the day of Eid is a day for happiness, you're not even allowed to fast on that day, you know? That's just proof that you're supposed to break the fast and eat and drink and enjoy and be happy or merry, right? Now, that's one. The second point was that we said one extreme is that everyone is ex uh, expecting to remain the same or the people would expect you to remain the same. The other extreme is when people switch immediately. And I'll tell you this true story, mostly just because it's funny, not that it has anything to do with happiness on the day of Eid. But my uncle actually witnessed the story with his own eyes. He, had a, he said, I had a friend 
who would only pray in Ramadan, only prayed in Ramadan. And in that country, it's a Muslim country, they announced Eid on the news. So he said, I was at his house and he's praying Isha and his family is watching TV and they're watching the news. And while he's in mid prayer, he heard the, the newscaster announce that tomorrow is the day of Eid Al-Fitr. And he said, the guy just went like this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. He's Hawadhu Billah. He stepped out of Salah that same moment. Because Ramadan's over, I only pray in Ramadan. Now, why am I mentioning that story? Because we all do that, but just not as suddenly and not as abruptly. You know, you continue with the Quran and the Adhkar and stuff, and then a little bit, and then you start to go back to lifestyle A versus lifestyle B. And the whole point is that we were to pick something up and continue it for, throughout the month. Now, uh, like I said in the beginning, I wasn't going to give you a program on what to do to make sure Eid is fun. I don't think anyone needs a lecture on how to have fun and how to be fun. Everybody knows it. We just need to know how far we can take the fun. Okay, and of course, yes, the food will make it so much fun, right? <laughs> the food will make it a lot of fun, actually. Actually, we imagine Eid without food. Yeah, so I think we're not going to disagree there. But I was saying that we just know where the fun begins and where the fun ends, and then you do what you want, as long as it's within the, the halal. Do whatever you want with your family, but don't make it a day of fasting. Don't make it a day of splitting the family on who's breaking fast, who's not, who's fasting still. Don't make it a day of remembering, you know, the deceased. Don't make it a day of, you know, it's the coronavirus and the sadness that's in the earth. Everybody knows how to have fun. Have a fun day with your family, with your kids. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our deeds in this month of Ramadan and that he free our necks from the hellfire. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give your family a happy and a blessed Eid and to enter happiness into your hearts and to keep you and your family safe. Zakum la khair for your attentive listening. Sallallahu wa barak ala mabrooth rahmatan lil alameen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Barakallah wa feek, Shaykh. May Allah bless you and your family and accept it. And may Allah keep your family safe and all of the Muslims around the world. Subhanallah, my dear brothers and sisters, I hope you were taking notes uh, so we can make the, the have the most fun and make the most of Eid that's coming. It's going to be a special Eid. There's going to be a different Eid. And we ask Allah that he uh, makes this day uh, joyful and he makes it a day that we uh, worship him even more. And we thank him for the, this Ramadan that's just gone. And we ask Allah that he accepts all the ibadah that we've done this Ramadan, all the ibadah that inshallah we're about to do uh, over the, the last few days of this blessed month. Next topic that uh, we're going to be discussing is discussing you and you post Ramadan, you in a new era post COVID. And who do we have? I have a special guest, someone who subhanAllah has become uh, even more dear to me in recent times. Uh, and somebody who, again, I want to congratulate. And we ask Allah that he makes a mean for him and his family to attain Jannah. Um, and this is none other than uh, Sheikh Dr. Sajid Omar, who, mashallah, most recently uh, attained his uh, PhD. Um, and I'll let him maybe discuss a bit more about that. Without further ado, uh, subhanAllah, I want to invite our dear Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Dr. Sajid Omar. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد as always we begin by praising Allah سبحانه وتعالى and we seek praises and blessings upon the final messenger Muhammad ibn Abdullah صلى الله عليه وسلم my dearest brothers and sisters in Islam I greet you with the greetings of Islam and peace and the greetings of the people of paradise. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to family events, family iftar online. Subhanallah, everything is becoming virtual. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Islam, subhanallah, time is flying. And I know this statement is not strange to everyone listening in. Because we know as we get closer to the day of Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to lift barakah and blessings in portions and amount, which means time will continue to fly. In fact, it's only going to fly faster, subhanAllah. And I highlight this given the portion of Ramadan that we are experiencing right now, subhanAllah. We are almost at the end. 
And at this moment, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our fasting, our standing in prayer, to accept our search for the night of power, to accept our recitation of the Quran, our charity, and all our acts of worship. And I ask Allah to make us from amongst those who are freed from the hellfire and those who have had all their du'as answered. In fact, I ask Allah to give us better than we have asked him for this Ramadan. Ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Brothers and sisters in Islam, subhanallah, just a few weeks ago, and it feels like literally yesterday, a guest knocked our door. And this is a guest that is beloved to us, to every Muslim household. It's a guest that every Muslim household waits to host every year. And it's not one of those guests that when it arrives in our cities or in our neighborhoods, it will put us in a state of anxiousness because we'll be nervous. You know, which, which home is this guest going to stop at? And if this guest stops at that home, then we've lost out. No, it's, a, it's such a generous guest that subhanAllah, when it visits us, it visits every single Muslim home, subhanAllah. And this guest, no doubt, is Ramadan. It's a guest that we wait for year after year. And I just said that this guest is generous in how it visits all our homes, but it's also generous in the amounts of gifts that it brings. Not only does it bring many gifts, but gifts in quantities enough to cover every Muslim household that is diligent in hosting the guest known as Ramadan. It comes to us with, with the gift of fasting. It comes to us with the gift of Taraweeh. It comes to us with the gift of Itikaf. It comes to us with the gift of Laylatul Qadr, the night of power and decree and virtue. It comes to us with the gift of freedom from the hellfire, the gift of the last 10 nights of Ramadan, the gift of the month of Quran, the gift of, of, of a training program towards patience, the gift of taqwa, inshallah, and so on and so forth. So many gifts and it's, no, it's, it's not surprising, subhanAllah, how we look forward to this guest every year. And we look so forward to this guest that subhanAllah, we prepare our homes for this guest. I mean, some kitchens, mashallah, become extremely busy in the month of Sha'ban, the month before Ramadan. Why? In anticipation for Ramadan and in preparing to host Ramadan, right? Because no doubt in some cultures, Ramadan is not a month of, it is a month of fasting, but also a month of feasting. And we do need to fix that, but that's not uh, the discussion today. The point is, brothers and sisters in Islam, we prepare for Ramadan just like anyone prepares for a beloved guest that is about to visit them. If it's a, if it's a normal guest, we make sure that the guest room is in order. We make sure that, you know, um, we find out from them, you know, their likes and their dislikes. And we make sure that the house is prepared and the home is ready to only cater for their likes and make sure that nothing that they dislike uh, you know, is, is or comes into play. We make sure that we check, do they have any food allergies? Do they have any uh, food that they cannot eat? And so on and so forth. And we make sure we, we stock the home with the right ingredients, right? And if the guest is, is worth it, we even make sure that we take time of work if we have to, so that we're not just, you know, out working and the guest is at home as if our home is a bed and breakfast for the guest. They're just there without any interaction with the people hosting them. We make sure we go the distance. And I'm sure we did that for the month of Ramadan as well. We tried to figure our timetables, we tried to uh, put in a new timetable specific to Ramadan to make sure that we receive Ramadan the way Ramadan loves to be received. But you know what, brothers and sisters in Islam, we said just a few weeks ago and it feels like yesterday. Well, guess what? In just a few days time and literally it's, go it's going to feel like a few hours. This guest is going to leave us. Subhanallah. And when this guest leaves us, this guest is going to give us parting advice. Why? Because this guest is generous, as we said. It's so generous that we even call it Ramadan Kareem. Right? Ramadan, the month of generosity. This guest sincerely loves us that it will leave us with sincere advice. And you should get ready for it. Because this guest is not one of those guests that, you know, comes to us with a sort of hit and run kind of relationship. We only see it when we see it. No, this guest will miss us after it leaves us. And this guest can't wait to come back to us after it leaves us, subhanAllah. So it will give us parting advice because this guest is a guest that loves transformation and all the gifts it brought us were gifts to aid our transformation. So when this guest leaves, this guest is going to tell us that my dear host, I'm really grateful for your efforts towards me during this month and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and reward you. But my dear guest, I want you to know 
that it is my sincere desire to meet you next year, but I can't guarantee that we will meet. Every year I leave homes, hoping to come back to those homes. But subhanAllah, when my time to arrive comes, I visit the neighborhoods and the people of those homes who I spent Ramadan with last year. We spent the month together last year. They're not available in the present year. Subhanallah. And I don't know next year if you will be available for us to spend Ramadan together. Subhanallah. I don't know. Ramadan will say, I don't know if Ramadan and you can spend the month together next year. There's no guarantee. You might return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my dear host, please ensure that as I leave, you don't forget that yes, Ramadan is over. And with me leaving, your home is going to turn back to normal. And this happens every time a guest leaves. Our home comes back to normal, right? If we love the guest, we miss the guest. But the home life comes back to normal, right? The, the, the voices, the voice of the guest is gone. The movements of the guest is gone. The things we used to love to cook for the guest. The guest is gone. Our life turns back to normal. Ramadan is saying the same thing, that your life is going to turn back to normal. Yes, it will. But understand that whilst Ramadan is gone, your quest for taqwa remains. The quest for taqwa remains. That's why Allah told you, perhaps you will attain taqwa. It's not guaranteed. So after Ramadan, you need to continue. This is what Ramadan will, will, will leave as parting advice. These are the gifts, the parting gifts of Ramadan. The gift of perspective. I don't know if I'll see you next year. So please understand that the Allah of Ramadan is the Allah of Shawwal and the Al-Qa'dah and the Al-Hijjah and Muharram and Safar and all the other months of the year. Be diligent with your Lord. Your quest for taqwa continues. I just came to act as a catalyst in your quest to achieve it. The quest remains. Don't forget the Lord that you worshipped in Ramadan during Shawwal and the months after till the next Ramadan. Subhanallah, what beautiful advice, brothers and sisters in Islam. And I pray at the end of Ramadan, we can actually train ourselves in the, in the re remaining few days to hear this parting advice that Ramadan leaves with us. Also, Ramadan will advise us in, as part of the parting gifts of Ramadan that my dear Muslim, my dear servant of Allah, understand that I have observed you for the last 29 or 30 days. And I have seen that you can achieve whatever you put your mind towards achieving. I am a witness to it because I saw you during this month. You left that which is normally halal every day for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Previously, you couldn't wake up for tahajjud. Subhanallah, I witnessed you this month standing for long periods of time every night worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I saw you searching for the night of power. I saw you subhanallah putting your hands, dipping your hands in your pocket, being generous and, and giving unconditionally. Subhanallah. Giving the giving of a person that doesn't fear poverty. I've seen this. You can do whatever you put your mind to. You put your mind towards having an amazing Ramadan and I saw amazing things from you. I want you to remember this. Ramadan will tell us as part of the parting gifts of Ramadan. That whatever you put your mind to, you will achieve. Don't belittle yourself in Shawwal. Value yourself. and Put your mind towards achieving great things. You will achieve it. And do the same thing for the remainder of the year until inshallah Allah decrees that we meet again. Why? I have seen you can do it. Ramadan will remind us that it is no doubt harder to leave halal because when you do halal, you get rewards. Some people feel it's harder to leave haram. No, it's easy to leave haram because you know there's a big punishment after the haram. You have help to leave the haram. With regards to doing good, you have help towards doing the good. Eating halal, drinking halal, uh, halal marital relations with your spouses. This is halal and there's rewards for doing it. For eating and drinking and uh, engaging life with your spouse. It's halal. However, in Ramadan, subhanallah, Allah made what is normally halal haram for periods of your day. And I saw you teach yourself that you can stay away from the harder thing. So if you can stay away from halal for one month, which is harder than staying away from haram, you have to believe that for the rest of the year, you, you can indeed stay away from haram. Believe, O servant of Allah. 
believe, O oh child of Adam. Value yourself. Don't belittle yourself. Don't say you can't. So Ramadan will leave with these advices, with amazing gifts as it came, bearing gifts. Now, brothers and sisters in Islam, in continuing with the theme of generosity and Ramadan, giving these amazing advices, I want to share a couple of advices with you all to help you on your way after Ramadan. Because I, I don't doubt that each and every one of us want to be amazing after Ramadan, but life catches up with us. And then somehow, some, in some way, we sort of lose our way, all right? So I want to share with you two advices to hold on to, uh, especially after this Ramadan, to aid you in getting through the remainder of the year until the next Ramadan comes. And Alhamdulillah, Allah will give us uh, Dhul Hijjah, the best 10 days of the year, to help us in our quest towards maintaining ourselves. He'll give us the month of Muharram to aid us in our quest in, uh, you know, um, in, in maintaining ourselves after Ramadan, until next Ramadan. But allow me to share with you these two pieces of advice. Firstly, brothers and sisters in Islam, let us learn from the ayat of fasting. And in particular, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs us towards the necessary time that is required to achieve transformation. You know, when we discuss the ayat of fasting, we, we somehow somewhere lose this important lesson because in the ayat of fasting and right at the beginning and right at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he, he pulls our attention towards the concept of time. He says, It's a fixed number of days. At the end, he goes, You have to complete the number of days. In your quest towards achieving taqwa, and perhaps you may after Ramadan, you have to put yourself in a training program of 29 or 30 days. It's not going to come at the click of a button. You're not going to push a button and have taqwa. You need to work for it. So Ramadan is teaching us an important lesson of life, brothers and sisters in Islam. The importance of patience and perseverance. The importance of looking after process. Looking after uh, the universal laws of life, that for, for you to achieve a great end, there's a great journey before it. Okay? All right? So why am I highlighting this? So that we don't give up after Ramadan. When Shawwal comes, it's not going to be the same as Ramadan. Shaitan is going to attack us. The doors of Jannah, uh, the doors of Jahannam now will be open again and so on and so forth. It's a different month. Respect process that as you go through Shawwal and the remaining months of the year in terms of trying to maintain your Ramadan and build on it, you will face resistance. You will face resistance. Okay, but don't be surprised about the resistance. And why am I highlighting this? Because in my time working with different communities, subhanAllah, I feel that they become, uh, they become shocked and surprised at the resistance and they feel, no, khalas, I can't and they give up. No, the resistance is normal. You have to push through it. But you have to believe that as you keep pushing, you, you are going to climatize. And what you're trying to achieve will come to you. And what you're trying to get rid of will leave you. There's always a teething period. There's always a period of turbulence when the plane lifts and goes through the different layers of the atmosphere. The plane has turbulence, right? right? And to get through that turbulence, it requires greater effort. You don't see the engines giving up. Until it gets to 30,000 feet, 40,000 feet, and then you see the engines relax, the pilot slows things down, now things are in motion. You went through the teething period, you went through the turbulence, but it needs you to carry on pushing through and not giving up. I find many people give up in Shawal, they feel, well, I tried, it's not going to happen, we'll just wait for the next Ramadan. No, it's normal. It's normal. You want to, you know, bring that Salat al duha in your life, it's normal that you're going to miss a few days. Don't worry, don't give up. You want to try and wake up for tahajjud. It's normal that you're going to miss a few days. Don't worry. Don't give up. You want to increase in your Quran. SubhanAllah, you find that you're going backwards. Right? <coughs> Excuse me. You find that SubhanAllah, in um, Ramadan, you pushed up your, your daily quota with the Quran. Now it's going back. And you were aiming to go forward. Don't give up. Maintain. If it goes back a little bit, don't worry. Pl pr you know, recite that a little bit. See what happened. Try and fix it the next day. So at least you can maintain levels. If you fail the next day, do the same thing, do the same thing, and you'll find with time at least you'll hit maintenance level, and inshallah you'll start growing. It's human nature. We need to go through incubation periods. That's why Allah gives us Ramadan as a 29 or 30 day incubation period, brothers and sisters in Islam. All right? So don't fear the resistance. It's normal. 
All right, it is absolutely normal. Don't become overwhelmed. Don't hyperventilate and cause yourself to give up because of the resistance. The resistance is normal. That's advice number one. And, and between 30 and 40 days after Ramadan, if you keep pushing on, you will write to me, inshallah, and you will let me know that, subhanAllah, you've pushed through the barrier. It's life, brothers and sisters in Islam. We have neurons in our brain. These neurons uh, represent habits, right? And they instigate habits. They are triggers towards habits. Those neurons will remain. They're going to come back as you eat three meals a day and as shaitan uh, comes back uh, into full flow and so on and so forth. These neurons are going to be pushing you in a particular direction. You need to create new neurons by pushing back and filling the place in your mind with the old neurons with more with, with you know with with abundant new neurons such that they drown out the voice of the old neurons i hope that makes sense so it's a process it needs time and subhanallah allah created us and he knows us better than we know ourselves so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes ramadan 29 or 30 days subhanallah so respect the process that's advice number one number two brothers and sisters in islam burn in don't burn out burn in don't burn out i know we have this excitement and we feel like we're going to climb Everest. But brothers and sisters in Islam, in Shawwal, we're not going to climb Everest. We're going to have to look for a smaller mountain. Okay? So, you know, sometimes what happens is we, we, we because of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the excitement that we feel and, and the, the Iman boost that we have, we set for ourselves timetables that are not pragmatic after Ramadan. Right? So we say in Ramadan, I used to read a quarter juice before Ramadan. Now I'm reading half a juice in Ramadan. After Ramadan, I'm going to do three quarter juice. Is that pragmatic? Not for everyone, brothers and sisters in Islam. It's not for everyone. So burn in. You need to understand who you are and who you're not. You need to understand the responsibilities around you. Everyone has different responsibilities. Some people homeschool. Some people send their children to school. Some people work from home. Some people have to work in the office. I know with COVID-19, most people are working from home. And no doubt, we have better control of, of our timetable, which means we have the ability to come up with a better solution uh, or a, a more flexible solution than last year. But the point is, understand your resources and your capacities and your capabilities and so on and so forth and create a timetable that's pragmatic in terms of your progress. Don't burn out. Right? Don't say, Khalas, I was waking up with tahajjud every night in Ramadan. I'm going to wake up every night after Ramadan. It's not going to happen. Because perhaps you're waking up with tahajjud in Ramadan because you're waking up anyway for suhoor. So be pragmatic. But that doesn't mean leave everything in totality, but build yourself up. If you are not reading tahajjud for one night of the year, at least after Ramadan, build it in. Say, khalas, after Ramadan, I'm going to read tahajjud twice a week. And try it. If you see twice a week, it's not happening. Make it once. Until once becomes normal, then include twice. Until twice becomes normal, build yourself. It might take a few months. That's okay. That's transformation. That's progress. You're sincerely working towards becoming better. And Allah is all knowing of what's in your heart. Then you do the same with the Quran. You increase, right? You find it's too much, you decrease a little bit until it becomes normal. Then you start increasing. You find that subhanAllah, I'm not so fluent in the Quran. So maybe this is a reason why I can't increase. So you find a teacher, you engage the Quran through learning how to become a better reciter. So this is burning in and not burning out. Rather than saying, I'm going to wake up with the Hajjud, uh, you know, uh, uh, every night. Or, or three times a week, and I'm going to fast every Monday and every Thursday, and I'm going to read one juice of the Quran, and I'm going to read Salatul Duhat, uh, you know, three times a week, and I'm going to, and I'm going to, and I'm going to, and then you find yourself slipping here, slipping there, slipping there, slipping there, and then Shaitan uses all these slips as a tool to overwhelm you and cause you to become the old person you were before Ramadan. And no doubt, Ramadan, when Ramadan comes to us next year, Ramadan wants to see us better than how Ramadan found us this year. Right, so Shaitan knows this as well, and he's going to work uh, against this to make sure that when he's chained next Ramadan, he can smile and say, "Well, I'm chained now, but wait, after Ramadan, I'm going to catch up with what I missed." Right, so we want to defeat uh, 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 Shaitan, and we want to respect our guest Ramadan, especially since we wait for Ramadan to come back next year. So, brothers and sisters in Islam, uh, number one. Respect the process. There will be turbulence. Don't worry about it. After 30 or 40 days, the good habit you're trying to bring into your life will become natural. And the bad habit you're trying to get out of your life will become natural. Fight. Value yourself. Don't belittle yourself. You can do whatever you put your mind to as Ramadan will tell us before Ramadan leaves. And number two, burn in and don't burn out. Unfortunately, my time has come to an end. But khairul kalam qalla wa dal, the best speech is that which is uh, short and sweet and to the point. And I hope, inshallah, uh, through the advices, the parting advices of Ramadan and my advices to you, I've left you with enough tools to ponder uh, during what remains of Ramadan so that we have 
greater progress and transformation after Ramadan. I love you all for the sake of Allah. And once again, may Allah accept our entire month and grant us better than we dream of in both worlds. Ameen. Until next time, Salamu Allahi Alaikum wa Rahmatuhu wa Barakatuh. Subhanallah, my dear brothers, as this event comes to a close, uh, I want to remind you of a few things. Uh, number one uh, is that I want to remind you of the prize giveaways. Uh, so you need to watch out for your emails. You have up until midnight tonight to sign up as many people as possible uh, to this great competition. And as I said before, the more emails and people you can sign up who are over 16 and have an email address, the bigger chance you have of winning that tablet and some vouchers for Amazon. So if you want to win, you know what you've got to do. You've got to sign up. Go to familye.com and you can find out all the details uh, there. Be uh, So my dear brothers and sisters, we mentioned our charity partners. MRDF, the Muslim Research and Development Foundation. Uh, please, I urge you to support them. We're going to be now entering uh, one of the last 10 nights of Ramadan. And potentially, it could be the night of Laylatul Qadr. And imagine you give sadaqah this evening uh, and you became you become one of those thousand people who give something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us it will be multiplied by more than a thousand months 83 years and we know that the scholars mentioned that this is uh, considered or equivalent to uh, a, a lifetime's worth of deeds Allah Akbar may Allah accept it from us and give us a tawfiq to make more of it so my dear brothers and sisters I want to thank our dear uh, shuyukh we want to thank their families for allowing them to partake I want to thank all of you for being a part of this amazing event and I also want to thank uh, uh, our women folk, our mothers, our daughters, our wives, uh, who are about to prepare your iftar. So I know many of us are preparing, and I hopefully you haven't uh, you haven't just been watching us uh, all this time. You've prepared some food and you've got something ready. If you haven't, you know you can do a takeaway, inshallah. I believe my food is going to be ready soon. So again, I want to thank all our mothers, our wives, our daughters, all of those who look after us, all of those who put food on our table. And we ask Allah that he protects us and reunites us all in Jannah of Fridaus al Ameen. My dear brothers and sisters, as I said, the special family Eid show will take place on the 24th, or sorry, the 25th of May at 5 p.m. I hope to see you there. More info, uh, more info and information will be coming out by email. So stay tuned, be a part of the competition, and don't forget to support our charity partner tonight, the Muslim Research and Development Foundation. Uh, with that, inshallah, I want to uh, bid you a farewell. Fi manillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Any change that you have, yeah, we're taking any change, every little bit is going to make a big difference. Any change, please, brothers. Jazakumullah khayr. Any change to charity, sir? Feeding the needy. Jazakumullah khayr. Whatever change you've got, inshallah. Jazakumullah khayr. Salam alaikum, bro. Listen, you need to be a little bit more assertive, yeah? Wa alaikum salam. Really, but, but... Yeah, just try and speak louder and talk to people. Uh, okay, inshallah. Salamka brother, uh, MRDF. What's MRDF brother? We build leaders brother. I don't want to waste my sadaqah, I, I want to give it to the needy. The Sahaba considered money being spent in the path of Allah as one of the highest forms of sadaqah. The people who are developed as Muslim leaders through our projects affect the lives of hundreds and thousands of Muslims. Every single good deed they guide someone to, you will get a copy of that deed. Allah will give you a share without taking anything away from them. You never know what impact they will go on to have.
just one brother that we know of started an Islamic channel that is on mainstream TV, benefiting thousands around the world. The choice is yours. This Ramadan, will you give a continuous charity that will carry on even after you are gone? Don't miss out. Click the button and start earning this reward now. And don't forget to share this video. It's free and makes a serious difference to our work. Islam 21C brings to you 20 brand new unique series from renowned and respected shuyuk from across the globe with one mission to bring Muslims together in an online congregation never seen before in history and lift the spirit of this Ramadan to bring us closer to Allah more than ever. The man is left with no way of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala other than by virtue of his of his names and his majestic attributes that he gave himself and gifted humanity with. We want to raise our children in the most perfect way and perfection belongs to Allah. If a person comes to you whose religion and character pleases you, then get your daughters married to him. It's not going to be easy, but Allah never leaves you alone. That's the essence of what we can get from the Prophet's life. It's my pleasure, it's my honor to introduce Quran recitation from uh, the Imam Jazri Institute. Now just think with me about the verse where Allah says, Inna Allah yumsiku samawati wal arda an tazula. We'll start with an ease one for you, Sheikh. Inshallah. Can I postpone Taraweeh until the last third of the night? Yeah, so um, <coughs> essentially the, the night prayer is offered after Salat al-Isha and you have until Salat al-Fajr to, to offer that. We're all, we're all linked together in this. And that's really what empathy is. I mean, empathy in, in the Arabic is like atuf, 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 to, to tilt towards, to move towards. <laughs> Conveying insults. You know, the Arabs had a saying, illa man The one who insulted you is the one who conveyed the insult to you. There can be no more greater relationship of a husband and a wife than the Prophet and Khadija. We don't just leave that piece of knowledge that we've received just there on the page. <laughs> This virus is a mercy for us Muslims because the Prophet ﷺ, he tells us in a hadith that when you're afflicted with something, it's an expiation of your sins. Down to earth like gravity, imagine me trying to turn my dreams to reality. Allah Jalla mentioned those who come in the front. They are the most successful people. How we can embed the love of the Quran in the hearts of the young generation? Welcome to the online masjid. Sign up now for your personal access to 300 plus free on demand video content. Ramadan has always been about the Quran, spirituality, and community. We fast together, break our fast together, pray together, and celebrate together. And it always comes at the right time and feeds your mind, body, and soul. But how can we do all of that in quarantine? For the most unique Ramadan we've ever experienced, the most unique experience we've ever launched. Ramadan 360, a global community experiencing Ramadan together to feed your mind, body, and soul. Wouldn't it be amazing to be in a position to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and say, Ya Allah, I wasn't a person who merely complained about the status quo of the ummah and wind. I was a person who supported the scholars of the religion. I made projects and I supported them as well. I was a person, Ya Rabb, who not only wanted to change what is within myself, but I also then after doing that, I wanted to change others and benefit them. Is it not a dream come true to be able to say such words?
make it a reality, dear brothers and sisters. Thousands of Muslims all across the world have benefited from our projects, alhamdulillah, and we want to be able to continue to do so, and we want you to share in the reward. Your money creates Muslims who benefit other Muslims, who go on to benefit other Muslims, creating a domino effect for your donation. And at this moment in time, we require 1,000 people to donate 100 pounds each to help us reach our goal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you a means of guidance. The Islamic Council of Europe is here to help you, to help you in your marriage, to help you in terms of relationship between both of you, to help you in your relationship with your children, to solve some unsolvable problems. The Islamic Council of Europe, providing support, guidance and solutions. <laughs> Any change that you have, yeah, we're taking any change, every little bit is going to make a big difference. Any change, please, brothers. Jazakum Any change to charity, sir. Feeding the needy. Jazakum al khair. Whatever change you've got, inshallah. Jazakum al khair. Sam, Uncle Bro, listen, you need to be a little bit more assertive, yeah? Well, I some really, but. but yeah. Just try and speak louder and talk to people. Uh, okay, inshallah. Slanka, brother, uh, MRDF. What's MRDF, brother? We build leaders, brother. I don't want to waste my sadaqa. I, I want to give it to the needy. The Sahaba considered money being spent in the path of Allah as one of the highest forms of sadaqa. The people who are developed as Muslim leaders through our projects affect the lives of hundreds and thousands of Muslims. Every single good deed they guide someone to, you will get a copy of that deed. Allah will give you a share without taking anything away from them. You never know what impact they will go on to have. Just one brother that we know of started an Islamic channel that is on mainstream TV, benefiting thousands around the world. The choice is yours. This Ramadan, will you give a continuous charity that will carry on even after you are gone? Don't miss out. Click the button and start earning this reward now. And don't forget to share this video. It's free and makes a serious difference to our work. Islam 21C brings to you 20 brand new unique series from renowned and respected Shuyuk from across the globe with one mission to bring Muslims together in an online congregation never seen before in history and lift the spirit of this Ramadan to bring us closer to Allah more than ever. A man is left with no way of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala other than by virtue of his, of his names and his majestic attributes that he gave himself and gifted humanity with. We want to raise our children in the most perfect way and perfection belongs to Allah. If a person comes to you whose religion and character pleases you, then get your daughters married to him. It's not going to be easy, but Allah never leaves you alone. That's the essence of what we can get from the Prophet's life. It's my pleasure, it's my honor to introduce Quran recitation from uh, the Imam Jazri Institute. 
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله Now just think with me about the verse where Allah says إن الله يمسك السماوات والأرض أن تزولا We'll start with an easy one for you Sheikh Inshallah Can I postpone Taraweeh until the last third of the night? Yeah so um, essentially the, the night prayer is offered after Salat al-Isha and you have until Salat al-Fajr to, to offer that we're all, we're all linked together in this and that's really what empathy is. I mean, empathy in, in the Arabic is like atof, 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 to, to tilt towards, to move towards. Conveying insults. You know, the Arabs had a saying, ma shatamak illa man ballagak. The one who insulted you is the one who conveyed the insult to you. There can be no more greater relationship of a husband and a wife than the Prophet and Khadija. We don't just leave that piece of knowledge that we've received just there on the page. This virus is a mercy for us Muslims because the Prophet وسلم, he tells us in a hadith that when you are afflicted with something it's an expiation of your sins. So down to earth like gravity Imagine me trying to turn my dreams to reality Allah Jalla Ala mentioned those who come in the front They are the most successful people How we can embed the love of the Quran in the hearts of the young generation Welcome to the online masjid Sign up now for your personal access to 300 plus free on-demand video content. Ramadan has always been about the Quran, spirituality and community. We fast together, break our fast together, pray together and celebrate together. And it always comes at the right time and feeds your mind, body and soul. But how can we do all of that in quarantine? For the most unique Ramadan we've ever experienced, the most unique experience we've ever launched. Ramadan 360 a global community experiencing Ramadan together to feed your mind, body, and soul. Wouldn't it be amazing to be in a position to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and say, Ya Allah, I wasn't a person who merely complained about the status quo of the ummah and whined. I was a person who supported the scholars of the religion. I made projects and I supported them as well. I was a person, Ya Rabb, who not only wanted to change what is within myself, but I also then, after doing that, I wanted to change others and benefit them. Is it not a dream come true to be able to say such words? make it a reality dear brothers and sisters thousands of muslims all across the world have benefited from our projects alhamdulillah and we want to be able to continue to do so and we want you to share in the reward your money creates muslims who benefit other muslims who go on to benefit other muslims creating a domino effect for your donation and at this moment in time we require 1000 people to donate 100 pound each to help us reach our goal may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you a means of Guidance. The Islamic Council of Europe is here to help you, to help you in your marriage, to help you in terms of relationship between both of you, to help you in your relationship with your children, to solve some unsolvable problems. The Islamic Council of Europe, providing support, guidance, and solutions.